Oh hey guys, um, Super Mario Carl here, and uh, for me right now it's spring break, so I thought I might do a little thing um, like I did last time where I played the SNES games. But I'll be doing another uh, story of the century entry here. Uh, rhymes. Uh, so this is a sci-fi sort of story I wanted to talk about during my uh, Run Saber Let's Play, but I got a little too focused on the game. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, called All Tomorrows, a billion-year chronicle of the myriad species and varying fortunes of man. Um, the story's author, like, in universe of the story, is a character known as Nemo Ramjet, but the actual author is a, a Turkish artist who draws, like, weird animals on DeviantArt. Um, and uh, I discovered this story because of a Spongebob meme, funny enough. Uh, I guess I'll, without further ado, I'll start it up. To Mars. After millennia of earthbound foreplay, Mankind's achievements on a noteworthy level began with its political unification and the gradual colonization of Mars. While the technology to colonize this world had ex existed for some time, political bickering, shifting agendas, and the sheer inertia of comfortable terrestrial up usurping had made this step seem more distant than it actually was. Only when the risks clearly began to present themselves, only when Earth's environment began to buckle under the strain of 12 billion industrialized souls, did mankind finally take up the momentous task. All throughout the decade, traveling to and later settling on Mars had been envisioned as quick, relatively easy affairs. Complicated, but feasible and manageable in short term. As the push finally came to a shove, it was realized that this was not the case. All had It had to go step by step. Atmospheric bombardment by genetically tailored microbes slowly generated a breathable atmosphere in a cycle that took centuries. Later, a, two, a few commentary fragments were knocked off course to bring forth seas, oceans, water. When the wait was finally over, remnants of Earth's flora and fauna were introduced as especially modified Martian remakes. While, when everything was ready, people came from their crowded world. They came in on one-way ships, fusion rockets, and atmospheric gliders, packed to the brim with colonists, sleeping in dreams of a new beginning. The first step on Mars was not taken by astronauts, but by barefoot children on synthetic grass. The Martian Americans for several hundred years, Mars had remained as a backwater, prospering, but still dim compared to the splendor of Earth, which was glowing brighter than ever before. Thanks to the relocation of environmentally demanding industries to Mars, Earth could usurp everything without having to damage its tired biosphere, which was the terrestrial heyday, a climax of economic, cultural, and social development on old Earth. This, however, was not to last. Like the gradual separation of America from her colonial mother, the government of Mars adopted a new Martian identity. They became the Martian Americans. The difference between Earth and Mars was not only political. A few generations in the lighter gravity gave the new Americans a spindly, lithe frame that would look surreal on their old home. This, combined with a certain amount of genetic engineering, took the Martian separation to a new level. For a while, the silent criticism between the two planets was mutually accepted, and the balance of power hung in an edgy equilibrium. But the Terra-Martian standoff did not, and could not, last forever. With limitless resources and an energetic population, Mars was bound to take the lead. Civil War The Martian turnover was expected to occur in two days, either through long-term economical gains or by a much shorter but painful armed conflict. 
For almost 200 years, the former method seemed to take effect, but this gradual stretch eventually did break in a most destructive way. Almost since its establishment, Martian culture was suffused with the explicit theme of rebellion against Earth. Songs, motion pictures, and daily publications repeated these notions again and again until they became internalized. Earth was the old, ossified home that held humanity back, while Mars was a new, dynamic, active, and inventive. Mars was the future. This ideology eventually reached a semi-paranoid revolutionary apex. Roughly a thousand years from now, the nations of Mars banded, banned all non-essential trade and travel with Earth. For Earth, it was a death sentence. Without the resources and industries of Mars, the terrestrial heyday would soon devolve into a pale shadow of its former glory. Since the trade of essential goods continued, nobody would starve. But for every citizen of Earth, the Martian boycott meant the loss of up to three-fourths of their yearly income. Earth had no choice but to reclaim its former privileges by force, if necessary. Centuries after her political unification, Terra geared up for war. Most thinkers and fantasists of previous time had imagined interplanetary glor war as glorious, fast-paced spectacle, spe spectacle of massive spaceships, one-man fighters, and last-minute heroics. No fantasy could have been further from the truth. War between planets was slow, nerve-wracking series of precisely timed decisions that spelled destruction on the biblical scales. Most of the time the combatants never saw each other, most of the time the combatants were not there at all. War became a duel between complicated, autonomous machines programmed to maximize damage on the other side, while trying to last a little longer. Such a conflict caused horrendous destruction on both sides. Phobos, one of Mars's moons, was shattered and rained down as meteorite hail. Earth received a polar impact that killed off one-third of its population. Barely escaping extinction, the peoples of Earth and Mars made peace and reforged a united solar system. It had cost them more than eight billion souls. Oh, the phone ringing. Star people. The survivors agreed that massive changes were necessary to ensure that such a war never occurred again. These reforms were so comprehensive that they entailed not political, economical, but biological changes as well. One of the greatest dis differences between the people of the two planets was that, over time, they had almost become different species. It was believed that the solar system could never completely unify until this discrepancy was overcome. The answer was a new human subspecies, equally and better adapted not only to Earth and Mars, but to the conditions of the most newly terraformed environments as well. Furthermore, these beings were envisioned with larger brains and heightened talents, making them greater than the sum of their predecessors. Normally, it would be hard to convince any population to make a choice between mandatory sterilization and parenting a newfangled race of superior beings. However, memories of the war were still painfully fresh, and it was easier to implement these radical procedures in the wake of such slaughter. Any resistance to the birth of a new species did not extend beyond meager complaints and trivial strikes. In only a few generations, the new race began to prove its worth, organized as a single state and aided by the technological developments of the war. They rapidly terraformed and colonized Venus, the asteroids, and the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. Soon, however, even the domain of Sol grew too small. The, the new people who inherited it wanted to go further, to new worlds under distant stars. They were to become the star people. Colonization and Mechanical Oedipi Even for the star people, interplanetary travel was a momentous task. Early minds had boggled over the problem and fantasies of such faster as faster than light travel and hyperspace emerged as the only solutions. Simply put, it was impossible to take a large number of people with enough supplies to even the closest star to make colonization feasible. The existing technologies could only slug along at mere percentages of light speed, making the journey an epic spanning affair. 
Enormous generation ships were conceived and even built, but these succumbed to technical difficulties or onboard anarchy after a few cycles. The solution was to first go there and make the colonists later. To this end, fast and small automated ships were sent forth to the stars. On board were semi sentient machines, semi sentient machines, programmed to replicate and ter terraform the destination and construct its inhabitants from the genetic material stored on board. A bizarre problem plagued such attempts. The first generation of humans to be manufactured sometimes developed a strange affection for the machines that made them. They rejected their own kind and perished after the massive identity crisis that followed. This technological Oedipus complex was not uncommon. Nearly half of all colony founding attempts were lost through it. Even then, however, the remaining half was enough to fill humanity's own spiral arm of the galaxy. The Summer of Man Right after mankind's colonization of the galaxy came to its first true golden age. Reared by machine prophets, the survivors of the Oedipal plagues built civilizations that equaled and even surpassed their solar forebears. This diffusion across the heavens did not mean a loss of unity. Across the skies, skies steady flows of electromagnetic communication linked mankind's worlds with such efficiency that there was no colony that did not know about the going-ons of her distant siblings. The free flow of information meant, along with other things, a vastly accelerated pace of technological growth. What couldn't be figured out in one world was helped out by another, and any new developments were quickly made known to all in a realm that spans centuries of light. Not surprisingly, living standards rose to previously unimaginable levels. While this did not exactly mean a galactic utopia, it was safe to say that the people of colonized galaxy lived lives in which labor, both menial and mental, was purely compulsory. Thanks to the richness of the heavens and the toil of machines, each person had access to material and cultural wealth greater than that of some nations today. During all this development, a curious phenomenon was observed. While alien life was abundant in the stars, no one had encountered any signs of true intelligence. Some attributed this to an overall rarity, while others went as far as divine influence, re resurrecting religion. Regardless of the theorizing, one question went truly and utterly unanswered. What would really happen if mankind ever ran into his equals or superiors in space? An early warning. During those times, a small discovery of immense implications warned humanity that it might not be alone. On a newly colonized world, engineers had stumbled across the remains of a puzzling creature, considered so because it had every hallmark of terrestrial animals on the alien planet, justifiably named Pandravis Pandora. A colossal fossil belonged to a bird-like creature with enormous claws, later researched to be highly derived Therizinosaur, from a lineage of herbivores dinosaurs that died out millions of years ago on Earth. While every other large land animal on the colony would have three limbs, a copper-based skeletal system, and a hydrostatically operated muscles, Pandoravis was a typical terrestrial vertebrate with calcium-rich bones and four extremities. Finding it there was as unlikely as finding an alien creature in Earth's own strata. For some, it was irrefutable proof of divine creation. The religious resurgent, fueled at first by mankind's apparent loneliness in the heavens, got even more intensified. Others saw it differently. Pandoravis had shown humans that entities, powerful enough to visit Earth, take animals from there and adapt them to an alien world. They were at large at the, gal were at large at the galaxy. Considering the time gulf of the fossil itself, the mysterious beings were millennia older than humanity when they were capable of such things. The warning was clear. There was no telling what could happen if mankind suddenly ran into this civilization. Benevolent contact was obviously preferred and even expected, but it paid to be prepared. 
Silently, humanity once again began to build and stockpile weapons, this time of interplanetary potency. There were terrible devices capable of novaing stars and wrecking entire solar systems. Sadly, these, even these preparations would prove to be ineffectual in time. Coup. In the first contact was bound to happen. The galaxy, let alone the universe, was simply too big for just a singular species to develop intelligence in. Any delay in contact only meant a heightening of the eventual culture shock. In humanity's case, this culture shock meant the complete extinction of mankind as it had come to be known. Almost a billion years old, this alien species known as Ku were galactic nomads, traveling from one spiral arm to another in epic spanning migrations. During their travels, they constantly improved and changed themselves until they became masters of genetic and nanotechnological manipulation. With this ability to control the material world, they assumed a religious, self-imposed mission to remake the universe as they saw fit. Powerful as gods, Ku saw themselves as divine harbingers of the future. This dogma was rooted in what had been a benevolent attempt to protect the race from its own power. However, blind, unquestioning obedience had made monsters of the Ku. To then, humanity was with all of its relative glories, was nothing more than a transmutable object. Within less than a thousand years, every human world was destroyed, depopulated, or even worse, changed. Despite the fervent rearmament, the colonies could achieve nothing against its billion-year-old foes, save for a few flashes of ephemeral resistance. Humanity, once the rulers of the stars, was now extinct. However, humans were not. Man extinguished. The worlds of humanity, gardens of Terraform's paradise, seemingly seem strangely empty to the queue. Or queue. Often there was no raw materials available other than people, their cities, and a few basic niches of ecology populated by genetically modified animals and plants from Earth. This was because humans had erased the original ecologies in the first place. Offended by another race trying to make the universe, the Ku set forth to punish these infidels by using them as building materials of their vision. While this led to a complete extinguishment of human sentience, it also saved the species by pre preserving its genetic heritage in a myriad of strange and new forms. Populated by Ursas humans, now in every guise from wild animals to pets, genetically modified tools, Ku reigned supreme for 40 million years on the worlds of our galaxy. They erected kilometer-high monuments and changed the surfaces of entire worlds, apparently to whim. One day, they departed as they had come, for theirs was a never-ending quest, as they would not, could not stop until they had swept through the entire cosmos. Behind them, the Ku left a thousand worlds, each filled with bizarre creatures and ecologies that had once been men. Most of them perished right after their caretakers left. Others lasted a little longer to succumb to long-term instabilities. On a precious few worlds, descendants of people actually managed to survive. In them lay the fate of the species, now divided and differentiated beyond, beyond record recognition. And that is um, what I guess is going to be part one of my uh, reading of this. Uh, so, uh, see you next time.